again to welcome everybody to our May webinar on MR neurography, improving the diagnosis uh, of nerve problems to advance MRI. And I'm especially fortunate to be able to introduce our speakers today, Dr. Daryl Sneeg and Dr. Exon Toy, uh, Tan. Sorry. So first I'd like to introduce Dr. Tan. He, in he uh, obtained his master's of engineering from the National University of Singapore before going on to do his PhD in biomedical sciences at Mayo Clinic. Uh, Dr. Tan was previously a principal scientist at GE, uh, where he was a multi-PI and co-investigator on several NIH grants. He also serves as an adjunct assistant professor of medical physics at the Mayo Clinic, and his research interests include quantitative MRI, uh, in particular diffusion imaging, as it applies to musculoskeletal imaging. Uh, we are very fortunate to also have Dr. Tan as a, a member of our education committee. And he currently serves as the co-director of the MRI lab at the Hospital for Special Surgery. He's also an associate scientist in the MRI lab, and he has an appointment at Weill, Weill Cornell Medical College. So welcome, Dr. Tan, and thank you for being here today. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Daryl Sneeg. Uh, Dr. Sneeg attended medical school at Albert Einstein before going on to do a uh, global health research fellowship in pediatric HIV and, and TB. Uh, his clinical interests include sports, spinal, and uh, peripheral nerve MRI. Dr. Sneeg works closely with physicians at the Hospital for Special Surgery uh, and the brachial plexus and traumatic nerve injuries to help guide operative and non-operative management. And Dr. Sneeg receives NIH support to study Parsonage's, Parsonage's Turner syndrome. Uh, we're again uh, fortunate to have Dr. Sneeg as a member of our education and research committees. And he currently serves as the director of, neurography, of MR neurography and MR, uh, MRI research at the Hospital for Special Surgery. And then he also, again, has an appointment at Weill Cornell Medical College. So thank you to our speakers today. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Sneeg. Stephen, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. It's my absolute pleasure uh, to speak along with alongside my colleague uh, today, Exun Tan, and uh, it's really exciting to be part of this Global Nerve Foundation, a really emerging foundation. I think it fills a critical uh, hole um, to serve patients and uh, help expedite their care. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and um, today's, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, today's uh, session will be divided uh, in half between myself and Dr. Tan. So I'm going to review MR neurography, a technique to image peripheral nerves, and discuss some of the clinical applications. And Dr. Tan is going to go into a little bit more detail with 3D rendering and visualization of nerves and also quantitative techniques as well uh, to assess peripheral nerves. These are my disclosures. So the overview of my brief talk will be some background on the technique of MR neurography, some technical considerations that I think about as a radiologist day-to-day -day in imaging in these cases, how I go about interpreting muscle and nerve on the MRI exams acquired, and some brief conclusions and future directions. So the coined MR neurography uh, was, sorry, the term MR neurography was co first coined by Howe and others in 1992, and in the study in the rabbit hind limb, they applied heavily T2-weighted and diffusion uh, sequences to visualize the nerve in the rabbit hind limb. And MR neurography or MRI as a technique to visualize nerves was soon uh, recognized even in the lay press in 1993. However, to this day, it, it, I, when I often speak about MR neurography, I consider it still somewhat of a no man's land falling at the junction between the fields of neuroradiology, where the focus is typically the central nervous system, and musculoskeletal radiology, where we focus on the extremities, but really attention is towards joint health um, and muscle injuries rather than the peripheral nerves. I'd like to just share some examples from my practice, kind of when I started uh, doing MR neurography approximately nine, 10 years ago or so. So the images on the left were um, older images acquired with older uh, magnets, software, coil setups, and kind of to what we are looking at today. And hopefully you can appreciate the dramatic improvement in terms of sharpness in the image, the acquired spatial resolution. And this is really made possible, again, by hardware improvements, which I'll get into in, in a little bit of detail in a moment. 
So I consider this kind of the current state of the art. This is an example of a 43-year-old firefighter who had bilateral Parsons Turner syndrome, as Stephen alluded to. This is a syndrome which patients often healthy develop severe pain followed by weakness. And here we're able to delineate focal constrictions of both suprascapular nerves and see these nerves well because we're able to suppress the background tissues, both the fat, the muscle, and the blood vessels and able to acquire this within a reasonable scan time in approximately just a little over six minutes. So what are the general motivations for performing MR neurography? Well, firstly, it serves in my mind as an important adjunct to electrodiagnostic testing. It's helpful specifically for nerve injury localization, especially when the injury may be multifocal or fascicular in nature, and therefore may be a little bit more challenging to localize precisely with electrodiagnostic tests. It's been shown to influence surgical planning and outcomes and lastly, it provides a global assessment of both the nerves and muscle. So rather than having to individually test each muscle as one may do with electromyography, we can look at many muscles in the same time or within the same acquisition. So I'd like to just uh, use one example to kind of illustrate the power of MR neurography. So let's take an example here, this cartoon drawing of a peripheral nerve divided into multiple fascicular bundles you can think of the peripheral nerve as sort of a coaxial cable. And when you're looking at it on FOSS, again, it's made up multiple fascicular bundles, which are a group of nerve fascicles. And then at a microscopic level, you'll see the axons. And let's take the example of a patient with an anterior interosseous neuropathy. Here, this woman is unable to closely approximate her thumb and index finger due to weakness at the, um, the FDP of the index finger and the flexor pollicis longus of the thumb. And now let's take an axial cut through the mid-arm region. And here in the oval, we see the median nerve. And I'm going to walk you through this because there's multiple arrows here. So if we are if we're aware of the topographical arrangement of the median nerve uh, within the mid to distal arm, well, if we can appreciate here in the red is the anterior interosseous nerve bundle and the pronator teres, the P and FCR, flexor carpi radialis, those assume a more anterior anteromedial position. So note here, when you look at the median nerve, and here's a zoomed in magnified inset in the bottom right, that only certain fascicular bundles are abnormal or hypertense and large, whereas this group of fascicles or fascicular bundles appear normal. So we have a lesion here at the fascicular level. And if we look at one of these abnormal fascicular bundles longitudinally, we see multiple discrete uh, regions of caliber narrowing. That is intrinsic constrictions of the nerves that is known to be associated with this condition. That is a, a form of Parsons turner syndrome. And the surgeon then, in a patient who has not recovered, is able to mark the skin precisely relative to the elbow joint so it doesn't have to op expose a very large region, but it can minimize the, the skin incision, localize the fascicular bundle by um, knowing, again, it's topical or, uh, uh, topographical arrangement and through intraoperative electrical stim, and expose these peripheral nerve constrictions. And the idea is to do a neurolysis to help uh, this woman here regain her anterointeroseous nerve function. I'd like to take a moment just to um, compare and contrast modalities of MR neurography or ultrasound, which is also a very powerful technique to evaluate peripheral nerves. And I put together this table, uh, just how I see the two modalities and, in terms of their advantages and disadvantages. So the, the big advantage with MRI of ultrasound is it provides much greater contrast resolution. And what does that mean? Well, that means the ability to differentiate the nerve from the background tissue and also to detect abnormality of the nerve. Typically, it's bright on T2-weighted sequences from the uh, normal nerve. Ultrasound at superficial locations has higher spatial resolution. So ultrasound is very valuable uh, for looking at very superficial nerves, um, often sensory nerves. However, the spatial resolution will decrease as the depth increases. One could argue that both modalities are operator dependent, or certainly ultrasound more so. MRI typically is a much higher cost uh, financially than, uh, than ultrasound. Um, MRI um, 
as, as this also relates to uh, spoke, spatial resolution, it provides greater access to deeper nerves. Um, and particularly the C8 and, and T1 nerve roots. And here's an example of not being able to visualize the T1 nerve root as it's obscured as it courses under the first rib uh, on ultrasound, whereas we can nicely delineate it here on the image on the right on the MRI. MRI is more sensitive to degradation of the image quality by motion. We do have techniques to handle metal, but um, when there's a lot, a lot of metal artifacts, sometimes ultrasound uh, can be a useful uh, technique. I want to come back to some of the technical consideration or what are some um, the hardware and, and software um, that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. And I consider these as sort of puzzle pieces. They are all needed to complete the full puzzle in order to ensure a, a, uh, a high diagnostic yield or a successful exam to answer the clinical question. So in terms of hardware, I typically like to image at three Tesla. 3T provides essentially double the SNR or signal to noise ratio compared to 1.5T. This allows us to either image faster so we can deal with motion better um, or acquire higher spatial resolution within the same um, acquisition time. Typically use um, conformable surface array coils. We want to get these received coils or you can think of them as antennae closest to the targeted anatomy. In terms of software, rely on both two-dimensional two techniques, and these are heavily T2-weighted fat suppressed sequences, again, to highlight the peripheral nerves and peripheral nerve pathology. They're typically very high in-plane resolution on the order of 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters, and we apply acceleration techniques to shorten scan time. For 3D techniques, these are not as high in-plane, but they have much higher through-plane resolution, that is thinner slices. And this allows me to evaluate the overall morphology of the nerves well. They're also T2-weighted fat suppressed. And lastly, well, after we acquire the data, we can reconstruct it differently. We can use some advanced reconstruction techniques, include denoising, deep learning algorithms, as well as taking advantage of deep learning methods, many of which have become uh, uh, commercialized uh, by many of the main MR vendors. When we think of nerve imaging, we really should think about neuromuscular imaging because it's critical um, also to evaluate the muscle. So here is an example of a patient with denervation edema of the right trapezius muscle. This is more in the, you see it more in the acute or subacute stage up to about six months. And unfortunately, if this is a different patient here on the right, and on you can see on the, the, the left trapezius is mark of the atrophied. So here, the nerve was injured, and unfortunately, the nerve did not regenerate. Um, and this was due to a injury during a lymph node biopsy, causing a neuroma of the uh, spinal accessory nerve. So, in chronic uh, states of denervation, uh, the muscle not only loses bulk but will undergo fatty infiltration, which is thought to be irreversible. So, now I'd like to shift gears slightly and just talk about how I evaluate nerves. Uh, on exam. So these are the criteria I use. Look at the size of the nerve. Typically, nerves are enlarged when they're abnormal. The signal intensity, they're typically hyper intense. Are they in a continuity? And the reason why I harp so much on spatial resolution is I try to appreciate the fascicular architecture. Is it preserved? Or in the case of a neuroma, is it lost? Or is there a tumor that's obscuring the fascicular architecture, the cross-sectional architecture of the nerve? When I look at the overall morphology, are there constrictions, such as in the case of partial Turner syndrome? Does the nerve follow its expected course or does it deviate? Is it maybe tethered to scar or bone? And, and, and doing so, we look at the fat planes. Are they preserved or lost? Is there some scar around the nerve? So these are the normal features. I want to, particularly in larger nerves, here in the example of the sciatic nerve, we want to look at the fascicular or honeycomb pattern. In large nerves as well, you may have uh, fat within the, uh, the epineurium itself or with, within the nerve bundle. So we can look for the normal striated appearance of the fascicular bundles alternating with layers of fat. And then lastly, look at the perineural fat. So here an example of the ulnar nerve, we see nice preservation of the fat plane around the ulnar nerve as it's coursing through the cubital tunnel. So in terms of signal, 
I use a typically a combination of proton density weighted images here on the left, and again, T2 weighted uh, fat suppress images. So this is here a Dixon technique. The nerve is typically the same signal or it could be slightly higher in signal compared to the adjacent muscle. So this contrasts this in the patient with carpal tunnel syndrome. I don't routinely get asked to perform MRI for carpal tunnel syndrome, but this patient happened to have it in addition to other risk pathology. Here we see marked enlargement of fascicular bundles of the median nerve within the carpal tunnel. Um, and then the flexor retinaculum um, that uh, will be released uh, during a carpal tunnel surgery. Here's a 26-year-old man with weakness and muscle atrophy in the hand. The blue arrow is pointing to the ulnar nerve at the level of the retrochondral sulcus in the elbow. The asterisk is showing an accessory and corneus epitrochlearis muscle that may be contributing to increased pressure on the nerve, because here the nerve is enlarged and it's hyperintense in a patient with cubital tunnel syndrome. So in terms of looking at size, here's in the lower limb. I work at an orthopedics hospital. We see many of these patients who may have uh, some foot deformities or, or need corrections, patients with Charcot-Marie tooth, here in large tibial, sural, and superficial perineal nerves in the distal lower leg. This is a 15-year-old male, an unfortunate case, he underwent a hamstring tendon release surgery. And unfortunately, at the time of the release, the common perineal nerve, just as it bifurcated from the sciatic nerve, is lacerated. So here are the proximal and distal ends of the cut nerve. Here are just foci of air at the operative site. Patient was taken to surgery by my colleague, Dr. Lee. The ends were found and the nerve was repaired um, soon after the, the surgery. Here's a 10-year-old female. This is an example of, of showing, showing you, hopefully, to follow the course of the nerve. 10-year-old female trampoline fall with both bone forearm fractures. So here, fractures of the ulna and the radius in the forearm. And here on these axial cuts, we're going to follow the median nerve delineated by the oval and look at its relationship uh, to the radius. So here, it maintains its expected uh, location. And as we scroll distally in the forearm, all of a sudden, it takes a quick dorsal course towards the cortex of the radius, where it's scar tethered to callus. And then lastly, it regains its expected location as we scroll distally. Here's an image using diffusion tractography just to illustrate that scar tethering of the median nerve to the callus along the radial cortex. The patient was taken for surgery. Here's that scar tethered median nerve, which is then released. And four months later, the patient regained her median nerve function. Is an example of now looking at so whether a process or a mass is intrinsic or extrinsic to the nerve. So here's an example of a peripheral nerve sheet tumor, uh, most commonly usually schwannomas, um, here involvement of the uh, ulnar nerve with the forearm. And we can use tractography. Uh, we don't usually use it on a for clinical purposes, but more for research purposes. But in theory, it can be used to illustrate the relationship of the nerve bundles relative to the tumor uh, for preoperative planning so as to avoid um, or to minimize the extent of nerve injury when the tumor is resected. Here's an example of a ganglion cyst sitting within the tarsal tunnel, compressing or impinging the medial plantar nerve. The far right image, we see slight edema on the proton density image of the dactylohalysis muscle compatible with an active denervation effect. And note the comparison between the hyperintense, slightly enlarged medial plantar nerve compared to the normal lateral plantar nerve that is not compressed. Here's a 35-year-old male, shoulder pain and weakness after climbing with a heavy backpack. Here we see isolated denervation edema of the infraspinatus with sparing of the supraspinatus. The normal appearance of the suprascapular nerve along its proximal segment after it leaves the upper trunk but hyperintense and, and enlarged uh, suprascapular nerve as it approaches the suprascapular notch. And this is because it's impinged upon by ganglion cysts, like they're rising from a labral tear sitting at the spinal glenoid notch. So sometimes it can be challenging to determine whether processes are intrinsic or extrinsic. Let's take an example of a 27-year-old man, recent onset foot drop, and he had prior surgery for the same condition. So what do we see here? Well, here we see the superficial perineal bundle of the common perineal nerve. We're not able to well visualize the deep perineal bundle because it's obscured by this ganglion cyst. 
we image slightly lower on the right and we see a tail of the cyst heading toward the proximal tibiofibular joint. And on this 3D image, nicely able to follow that tail that's following the course of the articular branch of the common perineal nerve. So some of you um, on this webinar may be familiar with this entity. Uh, this is an example of an intraneural ganglion cyst uh, dissecting along the common perineal nerve. You can have extraneural components as well. Here's the scar from the prior uh, surgery. Um, and here, uh, the surgeon is delineating the deep, deep and the superficial perineal branches. The articular branch um, was not resected at the time of initial surgery, and that's uh, thought to be why the, the cyst uh, recurred. So the articular stalk um, is taken, and hopefully that ganglion cyst won't recur. So lastly, one of the important considerations uh, to think about or, or that I think about when evaluating nerve cases in the setting of uh, preceding trauma is whether there's a neuroma. What is a neuroma? Well, it's a benign disorganized uh, proliferation of neuronal cells arising from a failed reparative attempt. So when we use the term neuroma, it typically implies that nerve is not going to go on and heal by itself. And there's different types of neuromas. It could be terminal, here in the setting of a stump neuroma, a patient who unfortunately went to above the knee amputation, a neuroma in continuity where the perineurium and or epineurium remain at least partially intact, and the neuromas can be partial or complete. So what do I look for on imaging to help decipher whether there's a neuroma or not? Well, in larger nerves in, in which I can appreciate the fascicular architecture, I try to discern whether it's preserved or lost. Um, the neuroma size will typically correlate with the native size of the injured nerve, but if the size of the, of the nerve is, say, 10 times its native size, that, that makes me suspicious that there might be a neuroma. And unfortunately, I can't really rely on the signal characteristics too much because they can be variable, and the contrast um, enhancement uh, of the uh, injured nerve could be variable as well. So again, loss of the normal fascicular architecture is an example of the superficial sensory branch of the radial nerve in the distal forum, a rather small nerve, but notice it's massively enlarged size. And I mentioned the variable signal characteristics. Let's take a different example, a 50-year-old man with numbness, one year following laceration of the right index finger. So here we see bulbous enlargement of the digital palmar nerve, the proximal and distal ends that look more normal. Cross-section, we see a massively enlarged palmar uh, digital nerve, and this was thought to be a complete neuroma in continuity. And notice on the gadolinium uh, post-contrast sequence on the right here, it's really no enhancement. So again, the enhancement can be variable and possibly delayed due to fibrosis. Here's a 23-year-old man, post-median nerve laceration. Here we see denervation edema of the thenar musculature. Note here that the solid black arrow is pointing to a neuroma involving only the radial portion of the median nerve with sparing of the ulnar portion. So an example of a partial neuroma in continuity. And here's a 35-year-old woman with superficial perineal neuromas refractory to multiple surgeries. So here, the one branch was buried in the bone, looks pretty good. Another branch was attempted to be buried in the bone, but we see marked enlargement um, of the nerve here. So this was thought to be uh, possibly uh, responsible for persistent sy symptoms. There was still neuroma um, despite the neurectomy and burying of the nerve. Here's a different patient, a 19-year-old man, post-neuroma resection and sural nerve grafting. Uh, in my experience, it could be challenging to determine whether there's still neuroma at the site of prior neurectomy. And what I look for is to, to try to discern whether uh, there's still fascicular architecture and continuity. Note that this surgical site is very bright relative to the native nerve, but I do appreciate fascicular bundles coursing through the nerve. And on ultrasound here, we see a similar appearance where we see the nerve bundles trying to approximate one another. And uh, this is thought to be a satisfactory incorporation of graft. Uh, disclaimer being is that this is still uh, kind of a poorly understood um, uh, area of MR neurography or of imaging of nerves in general is what is the post-operative appearance of the nerve, expected and unexpected appearances. So to conclude, MR neurography is an underutilized but a highly valuable technique 
optimize hardware and software are needed for a successful exam, imaging at a high field strength of three Tesla, using flexible, conformable coils, using a combination of T2-weighted fat suppressed sequences and sometimes vascular suppression. And in terms of future directions, we'd like to keep pushing the spatial resolution both at three Tesla and maybe even at seven Tesla, uh, developing even more dense uh, coil arrays and that are more conformable and more flexible, uh, continuing development and optimization of AI algorithms to maybe achieve super resolution images. That means to uh, possibly uh, reconstruct an image that is higher than the acquired spatial resolution. Um, one of the challenges in MRI that I alluded to is motion, and particularly respiratory motion. And lastly, development of robust quantitative imaging biomarkers to assess the degree of nerve injury, muscle denervation, and predict nerve regeneration. So thank you very much for your attention. On that note, on quantitative imaging, I'd like to turn your attention to my close colleague, uh, Dr. Tan. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, uh, Daryl, and also thank you again, uh, uh, Stephen McConaughey for the kind invitation and to the uh, Global Nerve Foundation. My name is uh, Ixun Tan uh, from Hospital for Special Surgery. I currently co-direct the MRI lab. Uh, let me just adjust one slide very quickly. Um, while I just uh, do this, just bear with me. Before I restart. Okay, here we go. So these are my disclosures. So as we heard from uh, Dr. Steen just now, MR neurography or, or MRN is very helpful for assessing both the nerve morphology, signal intensity, and also to look at the muscle quality in terms of the signal, its bulk, and also the fat. Shown here an example of a subject with uh, Parsonage Turner syndrome having constrictions of the suprascapular nerve affecting the supraspinatus and also infraspinatus muscles. And um, one interest for me is to look at these uh, techniques a little more and to advance them as an MRI physicist and a biomedical engineer. Um, and I work very closely with Dr. Sneak on these, on these cases. And I would like to, my goal in particular as an engineer is to how can we improve MRI evaluation? And that's what I will speak about today. So today we'll discuss improving MR nerve evaluation by performing 3D visualization of the nerve with a bony MRI. Second, I will discuss improving MR muscle evaluation um, using quantitative evaluation of muscle health. And many of these techniques are currently being uh, researched. And I'll show you some of our research results. And third, I'll show you a little bit of what we're currently working on in terms of quantitative nerve evaluation. Um, so to visualize the nerve in three, uh, for three-dimensional uh, neurography, this is an example of a reformat of the elbow and showing the ulnar nerve here on a reformatted uh, sequence from 3D MRN. Some of the common MRI techniques that you may know about, such as uh, Cubester, Mensa, Spacer, and so on, can be used to obtain this MR neurography. What we'll first do is to segment these nerves using uh, one of the vendor uh, provided software tools and 3D render them. Next, we acquire a 3D bone MRI image and some of the techniques that are available, you would, might hear about them such as a CTE and uh, an osteo. And we would also segment and render the 3D bone. And next, what we'll do is try to combine them in this fashion and be able to uh, provide some kind of 3D rendering and rotate these uh, nerve and only landmarks around. So that's the general principle of doing this. Next, I'll show you some ex different examples. Here's an example in the brachial plexus of a 38-year-old male with axillary nerve constriction from Parsonage Turner syndrome. The delta is denervated, and you can see the constrictions in the nerves very shortly. We'll also acquire a 3D ZTE for the bone. We'll then render both of them together as shown previously. And here you can see the constrictions in the axillary nerve. 
and the earnings courtesy of, courtesy of our colleague from GE Healthcare. And we'll be able to spin this around so that the surgeon can see both the bony landmarks against where the nerve constrictions are. Next, I'll show a different example. Sorry, before I show the example, here is an image from our from Dr. Wolf showing the, um, the constriction uh, during surgery. The next example is in thoracic outlet syndrome. There's rib synestosis. And this is an example that is currently impressed in, in radiology, 26 year old female with neck pain and prestigious for two years. So we see that in the MRN, there's hyperintensity in the brachial plexus, and we can observe the rib synestosis as well from bone MRI, render these together and be able to visualize the area of the hyperintensity against the rib synestosis in 3D. I'll just let it spin us for a little bit, a few more seconds. The next example is in the elbow. This is a 10 year old female with, uh, with a fractured elbow and the elbow was, was relocated. However, the median nerve was uh, entrapped uh, as a process of either the fall or because of the relocation. We can see with 3D MRN that the nerve, median nerve is entrapped in the growth plate. And we can also compare that against the 3D uh, bone image, the ZTE image. In addition, we use deep learning reconstruction or DL to improve the image quality by reducing noise and sharpening the images, following which we'll then render with 3D rendering. And you can here see an example of the trapped media nerve at uh, the growth plate. And sorry, just to back up here, you can see in a correlation against a uh, a picture taken during nerve transposition surgery. In summary, for 3D nerve visualization, um, 3D MRN and bone sequences may optionally be acquired during the MRN exam for 3D visualization. We can use 3D rendering tools from the MRI vendors on our PEC systems. And these may be useful for preoperative visualization for educating the patient and perhaps in medical education as well. Next up. I'll just show you one slide on a brachial plexus MR neurography atlas that is developed by Dr. Phil Kolochi from a colleague of mine in the Department of Radiology, where he has acquired these MR images in different sections, uh, orthogonal to the nerve and also uh, uh, longitudinally. And you'll be able to observe these uh, different uh, annotated uh, nerves and also muscles in this atlas. The next subject is on improving MR muscle evaluation. In, uh, and uh, in this case, I'll focus more on muscle denervation. Often we'll use electrodiagnostics exams such as EMG to depict muscle function and abnormal activity. And qualitative MR, MRN, as Dr. Sneen mentioned, is an adjunct, can be used as an adjunct to electrodiagnostics and evaluates both the nerve and muscle qualitatively, but not quantitatively. There are many quantitative MRI techniques and in particular, we add a 10 minute uh, set of sequences to our current uh, MRN exam, which will provide a mapping of tissue microstructure. These are some of the sequences that we currently acquire. One of them is T2 mapping, which tells us about the extent of water edema. The second is a diffusion of fiber diameter mapping, which tells us about microstructural uh, muscle atrophy. And the third is a uh, fat fashion mapping. In addition, I put some acronyms here that you may commonly see used for T2 mapping and fat fraction mapping on, from your MRI vendors. Here's a paper that we published on T2 mapping and correlating these against uh, EMG results. As you can see from the top row of these images, qualitative MRI provides a hyper intense um, appearance of the denervated muscle. But with uh, quantitative T2, we can observe that uh, color difference quantitatively in the denervated muscle. We compared uh, qualitative and quantitative T2 against EMG, and we see there's a higher degree of agreement with the quantitative T2. However, I will note that in addition to these, we will need to perform further corrections such as B1 plus and denoising to improve the uh, uniformity of images. <laughs> 
The next method that we use is uh, apparent fiber diameter mapping, which is some technique that we develop here at the hospital for special surgery. In histology, we see that the muscles are on the order of about 20 to 120 microns in diameter and approximate uh, cylindri cylindri uh, cylindrical in shape. So we can model uh, the muscle fiber as a cylinder, and we can model the restricted diffusivity cross-sectionally to the, to the muscle and actually using uh, Gaussian diffusion. When the muscle undergoes a mild atrophy, the diameter will reduce and the restricted diffusivity will decrease. When there's severe atrophy, there's a loss of membranes in the muscle and, and therefore there's breakdown in water diffusivity and it can go through the muscle and therefore the parent di fiber diameter may go up. This is an example of a readout from, an ex from a subject in the forearm with denervation in the median nerve, showing that the FDP radial portion and the FCR have, hyper, have uh, increased T2 values. And we can observe these, this uh, scatter plot of the T2 values against the fiber diameter here and see that they are distinctly uh, separate from muscles that are uninvolved in the disease. This is a different example of a foot drop in the calf. And here we see that there is a high, increased uh, T2 values and majority of the muscles, in fact, all of them, as compared to normal values of about 35 milliseconds. In fact, we see that the fiber diameter is increased because there is breakdown of the, of the fiber. And also we see an increased fat fraction as well, suggestive of fat infiltration from a chronic denervation from a foot drop. I'll show you some results from a study that we performed uh, comparing a uh, quantitative MRI against uh, neuropathy in the brachial plexus. Our goal was to compare a uh, QMRI against uh, EMG. And we hypothesized that QMRI differences can be observed between EMG grades of uh, motor unit recruitment and abnormal muscle activity in terms of denervation. We had 30 subjects with neuropathy involving the brachial plexus who underwent a clinical MRN plus additional 10 minutes of QMRI. We evaluated five muscle regions and obtained a number of different muscles. The EMG and MRI were about on average 11 to six days apart. These are the EMG measurements that we obtained and also the QMRI measurements that I explained before. Here's an example of one of these subjects with Parsonage Turner syndrome, showing there's hyper intensity of the, of the uh, involved muscle, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and constrictions along the nerve. When we analyze the quantitative uh, values, we see that the T2 is high in the infraspinatus and also the supraspinatus, but it's low in teres minor and deltoid that's not involved. The fiber diameter on, on reverse is reduced in the infraspinatus and supraspinatus relative to the normal muscles. When we look across all the different subjects, we see that there's an increase and T2, as the extent of uh, motor unit recruitment, is, becomes more severe. And conversely, we see that the diameter is reduced as motor unit recruitment is uh, reduced. These are some of the results that uh, amplified a bit more, showing that they also correlate to the fibrillations and positive shock waves in these subjects. In summary, for muscle uh, evaluation, Quantitative T2 assessment is less subjective than qualitative T2 weighted MRI assessment of the muscle. This is a tool that is widely available but requires careful study of reproducibility. The diffusion uh, muscle fiber diameter tool may characterize muscle atrophy, and this is a research tool that we are currently still developing and trying to validate. Quantitative fat fraction may also characterize chronic muscle changes. This is also widely available. Uh, but primarily used in the research setting for assessing myopathy and neuropathy. Next, I'd like to show you some future directions in neuromuscular MRI in terms of nerve visualization. And I'll just skip right to, to that in the interest of time to explain how we like to qu uh, quantify uh, nerves more quantitatively. This is one of the uh, sequences that we've been currently uh, developing and working with. It's called 3D-DES provides two images uh, here, one that is less T2 weighted on the left and one that's more T2 weighted on the right. We typically use the one image on the right for a qualitative assessment of the longitudinal path of the nerve. In addition, there is a, a 
a known relationship between these two images that's associated with the T2 value of the nerve. And therefore, we can obtain a T2 map by just uh, doing some quantitative uh, calculations. And we can see that in this case, the nerve is bright, has a bright T2, and also the associated denervated muscle also has a bright T2. In addition, this T2 map is acquired at the same high spatial resolution as qualitative maps, so it's useful for quantitation. We did a preliminary study to show that there were uh, significant T2 differences in both the nerve and the muscle in the abnormal nerve versus control nerve, as shown in this early work by research assistant uh, uh, Grayson Campbell. Next, I'll just uh, conclude by showing you this case of a sural nerve stump neuroma uh, post transaction from uh, gastronomia's recession. Here you can observe the proximal stump and the distal stump on a 3D uh, MRN. And we can do what's called a mid or maximum intensity projection to observe the, the distance between the two stumps. And what's remarkable is that we're able to do this despite the small diameter of the sural nerve. Additionally, we would like to add a, a T2 map from this uh, death sequence, and we'll be able to observe this hyper-intense uh, T2 approximately, and this may help guide uh, the surgeon on where to resect the nerve. And therefore, some of the questions that we are able to answer today uh, may be amplified by increasing uh, the confidence of the neuroma presence or absence, having precise measurement of the neuroma size, and also to determine the spirability of the distal stump. I'd like to acknowledge um, the MR lab and thank various members uh, for contributing to our work. And thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Exxon, for that great talk. I see um, I'm going to just stop sharing if I can. Let's see if I can do that. And um, Thanks again. So now we're together. We were in the same room <laughs> to begin with, just with the camera swerve. And I do see one uh, comment, a thank you comment in the in the chat section. Um, but I don't see other any other questions at this time. Uh, feel free to type any questions. Um, if not, um, I don't know if Stephen, if you have any questions, or otherwise we can just conclude. I did just have uh, a couple. So one would be, uh, what is the time frame? doing with MR neurography as far as going from capturing the images to the processing of the images? Is it hours? Is it days? Is it longer? Right. So for qualitative imaging, it's typically instantaneous. Um, some of the advanced reconstructions might take uh, maybe a minute, uh, but really no longer than that. So typically it's reconstructed um, on the magnet. For the quantitative imaging, um, that uh, does get processed offline. Um, however, uh, Dr. Tan has set up a pipeline uh, for that reconstruction. And then the analysis is really, uh, some of it is uh, automated, some of it is a little bit manual. Um, so therefore it depends on the kind of the complexity of the exam, what variables would need to be um, evaluated. For the 3D rendering um, portion of it, um, that also some of it is automated, um, and some of it is manual in terms of segmenting the nerve um, and then combining it with the, the bone image. But I think we're becoming more and more uh, familiar with, with that technique and kind of increasing the, the efficiency of that reconstruction. You know, sometimes as we're busy orthopedic hospitals, sometimes the patient will get imaged in the morning and go for surgery uh, a few hours later in the afternoon and we are able to turn it around uh, for the surgeon so they can kind of get a roadmap prior to proceeding with surgery. Excellent, thank you. I see a couple of questions came in, so I'll uh, I'll mute myself and let you guys answer those. Okay, so the first question I see here are the transverse longitudinal images acquired from the same scan. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, it depends on if it's 2D imaging, we typically acquire separate acquisitions um, and the 2D images are typically um, orthogonal relative to the nerve. Um, if we acquire a 3D sequence, and particularly if the 3D sequence is what's called isotropic, which means it has the same dimension um, uh, in each direction, then those can be uh, manipulated and changed into any uh, arbitrary plane. 
So just to so to to to, to I guess to summarize the three D imaging, um, we can acquire a single acquisition and reconstruct it in both axial longitudinal images. Whereas two D two D images are typically acquired in the plane um, that they're uh, evaluated in. Next question um, was: Have you seen longitudinal changes in signal intensity? quantitative assessment after nerve injury and how does this affect your assessment? I think maybe I'll uh, take the first step of the question and then maybe have Dr. Tan comment on the quantitative portion. So on the qualitative side, in terms of the signal change, um, what, what we do see is not only at the site of the injury, but it could be signal change, often hyper intense, but we see upstream and downstream effects. The downstream effects are thought, at least it's important in the literature, that they might be due to Wallerian degeneration. Um, if there is axonal damage and the upstream effect could be due to uh, axoplasmic blockade and venous congestion. Um, so in terms of the assessment, um, I would say that, you know, I look, so, so therefore, you know, if you have signal change, both upstream and downstream, you might say, well, how do you know where to localize the image, um, assuming that there's no structural changes? I typically look for the maximal um, area of signal intensity, usually it's most maximal at the site of the injury. Um, quantitatively, I don't, you know, I think this is something more that we're still exploring, but you know, if Dr. Tan wants to add to that. Sure, I'll just add briefly. Um, I think for quantitative nerve uh, injury, we still don't have enough uh, experience on that uh, in terms of the longitudinal changes. For muscle, though, we do see uh, quantitative changes as early as about three days or so, and definitely within a week. Uh, these changes really depends on, uh, uh, on the type of uh, muscle denervation. They tend to the T2 tends to increase and muscle diameter would tend to uh, decrease as well as we we follow this in one of our uh, longitudinal cohorts on Parsonage Turner syndrome. Um, when there is a chronic uh, fat infiltration, though the T2 continues to increase, the fat fraction would start to increase as well uh, more uh, more rapidly. These are um, just uh, just to summarize something. So the next question was, how long does it take for a complete neuroma to develop after an injury? And I must admit, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I would think that uh, probably have to, I don't know if like soon you've looked into the literature on this, but um, you know, it deferred maybe more to the surgical literature um, in terms of the development of neuroma. The next question is how effective is MR neurography for delayed identification of trauma? For example, three weeks post-injury and unclear if there's a nerve laceration, is it accurate to identify? So I think what the question is getting at is, you know, it's one thing if you image immediately, you see the gap in the nerve as I showed in one, in one of the examples, but if you're imaging three weeks later and now you may have a lot of scar tissue in that area, are you able to discern exactly where the nerve ends are? And I would say, yes, routinely you can identify it. We typically can uh, differentiate uh, some scar tissue versus the nerve tissue, um, particularly if the nerve is larger, we can appreciate some of the fascicular architecture. Admittedly, if there's a ton of scar in the area and the nerve is very small, then that can be challenging uh, because sometimes the scar can, can obliterate uh, visualization of the nerve and, and therefore it uh, be more challenging. Uh, the next question um, was uh, uh, from a, a colleague of a colleague in Taiwan, actually one of our colleagues of a, a, a research fellow. And the question uh, as regards to the postoperative uh, appearance of the nerve graft or nerve transfer. The question is, have you looked into cases where failed nerve transfer was suspected and proved it with MRI or ultrasound imaging? And is there a biomarker of the distal nerve that is will there generation or the muscle that you could use? Um, I would thank you for the question. I would say this is a, a bit of an unexplored uh, area, but it's something important to explore because, you know, the surgery doesn't work 100% of the time. Um, I think, you know, we often use the muscles as surrogate, just like on EMG, um, particularly around the brachial plexus where the nerve conduction studies may not be um, as reliable. You're using EMG to evaluate the integrity of the muscle and therefore, uh, based on the quality of the muscle, the motor unit recruitment, or denervation status, you can infer uh, whether the nerve transfer uh, held or not. So similarly on MRI, I would say we rely uh, heavily on the muscle evaluation, whether the architecture is preserved or lost. 
terms of actually um, imaging that nerve transfer site, I would say, particularly with small nerve transfers, or for example, an intercostal nerve transfer uh, to another nerve, I don't have much experience with that, and it, it's likely challenging. Um, but I, but uh, I, I'm always, uh, I always try to um, to look into that. Dr. Tan and I are exploring um, use of uh, techniques to uh, evaluate Wallerian degeneration. Um, we know that macrophages are heavily involved in malaria degeneration, and so maybe in the future um, there could be a biomarker uh, of malaria degeneration that we could use. Um, the next question was, is this technology even more powerful for animal research settings, for example, higher T magnets that might not be approved or suitable for clinical use, but able to accommodate small animal research? Exu, why don't you take that question? I think I think for sure because then you have more uh, signal to noise ratio at higher field uh, magnets that are common to uh, animal magnets. So certainly um, these techniques will apply uh, to animal research, uh, especially for quantitation. I think so because uh, with quantitative MRI, often we have uh, acquisition at lower spatial resolution. So uh, some high field strength magnets may offer uh, T2 mapping higher spatial resolution. Uh, diffusion is uh, the jury is still out as to whether high field would be beneficial for diffusion uh, acquisition or not. Uh, people kind of the, at least the field is kind of consensus is between three to seven Tesla or so, but not uh, beyond that. Thanks. So the next question is: Is there a correlation between pain and a bigger neuroma on MRI? That's an excellent question. Something that I've wondered and something that I think needs to be explored. Uh, I'm not sure if there is a correlation uh, between the two or not. Um, I think one of the you know, things that I always question when I'm looking at the neuromas, particularly in the setting post amputation, a patient comes with pain, is what characteristics on imaging can I use to determine whether I think that neuroma is painful or not? Um, or, or whether I can predict by MRI, certainly, you know, the physical exam would be the most important, but if there are additional imaging biomarkers that could help, um, that would be useful. One thing I have thought is that if there's um, a, what looks like relative preservation of the fascicular architecture just towards the stump of the nerve where the neural may form, that's may imply that there's um, uh, less kind of angry um, or, or painful neuroma, but this is something that uh, not formally studied, and it's just really a guess at this time. So the next question is, can you measure the space that is room of the thoracic outlet syndrome? For example, if the first rib is actually compressing the plexus, or if it's just a scaling anterior muscle compressing the plexus. So on exam for thoracic outlet syndrome, I do routinely provide the intervals between the first rib and clavicle, both in the neutral position, with the arm in the abducted, externally rotated position. Um, however, um, to my knowledge, there's only one good study in, in, in uh, the radiology journal 2003 that looked at the interval differences uh, between healthy controls and symptomatic patients. And I would say that it's hard to standardize currently the position of the arm in that Aber position, or even the neutral position. And therefore, I provide these numbers um, to the surgeons, but I'm not sure how useful it is. As Dr. Tan showed, when we do see a, an abnormal synostosis or maybe a cervical rib, we are able, able to directly uh, uh, depict the relationship of that, that bone relative to the nerve. Uh, I think there was an answer to someone's question that provided, uh, just an interesting question in terms of um, longitudinal changes, say there's no correlation. Maybe that's for pain. <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> okay. Uh, there was another uh, follow up to a previous question. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think um, I really appreciate all the questions. Um, as you can see, there's probably as many unanswered questions as uh, answered questions. And that's why, you know, Stephen, I commend you um, and the foundation for really pushing this effort forward to further understand nerve problems and, and really connect patients with the appropriate uh, physicians. Well, I appreciate uh, both of you this morning. So thank you to Dr. Sneag and to Dr. Tan for taking the time.
uh, to give this webinar today. As he said, still a lot of unanswered questions. Great conversation. Thank you all to the attendees who submitted uh, questions. We'll send a follow-up email for uh, the link on YouTube if people have uh, questions. Still, they're always welcome to post comments there. And, uh, and we'll be uh, sending out some information soon about our June and upcoming additional webinars as well. So thank you all again. I hope you have a great rest of the day.